so another Friday and another great topic on the latest innovations within the project management community. Yes, it is. How are you doing, Merv? I'm, I'm uh, doing just, did I tell you my, my favorite kind of little uh, ditty that if I were, if I were any better, I'd be twins. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I like that. I probably used that before, so I shouldn't do it again. <laughs> no, Listen, that's, to, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, no, I, I was pleased to see the topic that you picked today, because with the um, with the latest innovations, I think this whole idea of principles coming to the forefront is is a big deal for us as project managers. Um, something to pay attention to. You know, it is. It is. I. I almost totally missed it when the PMBOK came out and I was saying principles and domains. Oh, what's the flavor this year? Yeah. And what's it going to do? But, you know, on further exploration and, and real conscious thinking about this, you know, true analysis, it really is fascinating. It really well, is. Well, let's see if I can get if we can get to a definition. And I think the best way that I can, this is how I put it in my mind. Uh, a few years ago, I was um, approached by my accountant when it came to tax season to take some mileage deductions for my work at our local church. I go to my local church every week, sometimes during the week to attend a class or to teach a class. And he was encouraging me that as a volunteer to that organization and it being a um, deductible or a, a charitable institution, that I could therefore take mileage um, deductions on my income tax. And I thought about that for a while and I said, no, that doesn't fit with my principles. We attend because we want to, not because we're looking for some sort of tax deduction or some sort of benefit in that regard. And so here's how I put this in my kind of this whole idea of principles. And we're, I think we're going to be talking about a definition here shortly. For him, he was following generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, which for him, he was acting within the rules. For me, it was more of a moral construct in terms of how I wanted to approach that particular situation. So I thought here we were working with both, both principles. We were both principled people, and yet we both had a different view of how to deal with this particular situation. I did not take, I mean, I was the client. I did not take the deduction because that did not fit my moral perspective of that particular situation. And he accepted that. But I think we were both right. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. You're going to really appreciate the definition. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so what I found is the simplest definition and, and the broadest and the clearest is a fundamental norm, truth, or value. Let's let's unpack that. Okay. A norm, accepted behavior or accepted normal behavior, and that's what your accountant was demonstrating. Okay. Yeah. Value, something within which I hold in high esteem. You know, I respect that. This is this is something that is, you know, has something that's great importance to me. And that's what you had. Now there's a third one, which is truth, which is really funny. When, when we get into ethics, we talk about this thing called truth, which is beyond what we can potentially understand. And when we talk about truth, it's something that's greater than what we know, which is absolute. So a principle is that norm is that value you're both right and it's something bigger <laughs> well in fact as i was looking at this myself <clears throat> what i found that for some like the example i used with the accountant he was following generally accepted accounting principles so that was a rule of his profession mm -hmm. as i read it within the pimbach pimbach is less prescriptive in terms of the principles that it's espo espousing but in doing so, it provides them as guidance, not as things that we have to do to stay within some sort of guideline. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're standards. They're not yeah. rules. They're standards. Yeah. They're, they are, like you said, they, they're, they're not regulations. 
things. Um, they're not de facto or de jure. They're, they're actually, this is a really good way of doing things. And if you do it, you get a better response, you know? And that, go, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, and what I, what, the other part of what I liked about the fact that now many bodies of, um, of many organizations have what they would call codes of ethics. We've talked about those before. Certainly PMI has its code of ethics. Certainly my accountant belonged to an accounting society that had its code of ethics. And so what I liked about the way that uh, PMI is espousing its principles is that they are not its code of ethics, but they are grounded within its code of ethics. Yes, yes, yes. I, uh, I uh, saw that too. The, the wording is beautiful. They're complementary. They yeah. weave in and out of each other. They are not the ethics, which allows us to actually incorporate our ethics and use the same general principles. Well, and by being grounded within the core set of ethics, it doesn't say that we have carte blanche to do anything we want. I mean, there still are some boundaries, but we can kind of operate within those boundaries. Similar to, similar to my example with uh, deducting the mileage for a charitable organization, my best friend going to the same exact organization probably would have taken that deduction. And that was fine with his, within his moral compass. So it's not a right or wrong. It's with what happens to pertain to us within the boundaries that are set for us. Yeah. And this is where things get really fascinating. Um, if you study human behavior and if you study philosophy, um, they look at a connection of values to principles in a really unique way. My values shape what I say is acceptable behavior. And my values actually create that sense of behavior and that behavior sets my habits and my habits actually create what I call the world around me. It's not necessarily what's happening there. It's sort of like what I understand compared to what's the truth. So our values actually establish our perspective of the truth. Now, the principles are somewhere in there between our values and our, uh, our behavior. They actually are the expression what you what you call they're they're intertwined with the values so i was i was going to ask you what came first the values or the principle <laughs> yes I think, I think you know you just uh, again it's it's like a rug it's like a rug are the one are the threads going vertical coming first or are the ones going horizontal the first you know exactly. it, yeah. it's the same thing so why do you think that uh, the latest version of the uh, of our guideline called the pin box seven why do you think they suddenly switched from more of a process oriented uh, pr before more of a process oriented guidance before to now introduce these principles? Why, where do you think that came from? Um, <clears throat> primarily, I think it was a mechanical change, a technical change that said we don't just want to talk about project management as traditional project management anymore. Um, and if you look in the introduction of PMBOK, they say, you know, this this allows us to think about beyond just traditional, but to agile and any other methodologies that may follow. They were seeing <laughs> the PMBOK with the traditional project manager getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they were saying, if we do this with Agile, and if we do this with any other methodologies, we're going to get in trouble. And they said, why don't we just do a meta description of project management above all these methodologies? And then we can reference methodologies as an application of general project management. That makes sense. And, and I think the other thing that I saw, <clears throat> what I found when I did a little research on this topic, was that um, PMI had gone out and had actually interviewed several project managers from several cultures and countries and, and that sort of thing. And they, they kind of honed in on these 12 that they published. And, and I was wondering if perhaps 
the reason they came out with this, having done all of that work, was maybe it's because the best of our breed should be doing these things anyway. So why not document them? That's that kind of hit that kind of came to my mind. I don't know. Well, and and you think about traditional project management too. Think about it growing out of these military projects with the Coast Guard, the Navy, and the others. And you think about, you know, having the Pert and Gert charts from one group, and you have the Gantt charts coming from another group, and you're comparing and contrasting, and you're doing the same thing. And lo and behold, in the late you know, in the mid to late 70s, all of a sudden, they're not talking about Pert and Gert, they're talking about Gantt, because it was, you know, good practice. And this mm -hmm. is the job of groups like PMI to do just this. And it, it's sort of like re <coughs> reassuring to know that this mindset continues to say, you know what, we actually figured this out, but it wasn't we, you guys did the work, and we just looked at the data. Well, that, that makes sense. In many ways, PMI is a leading organization, but I think it can only lead based on what we in, in, our, um, in our domain are doing anyway, right? So it's they're leaders, but they take their lead from us. Well, and again, they're steering, they're yeah, advisory. They, they are not decision makers. They are the collection of wisdom, just like a PMO. They're, they're just like an advisory PMO. Yeah. So I was just, I'm looking, I don't know if our audience is that interested in this, but let me at least name them from, there's 12 of them. I'll do it slowly. So I was looking at they, um, and this is no particular order. There's no um, priority order here. So it's, we're to be diligent, respectful, caring stewards. That's an interesting thing. We should follow up on that whole idea of stewardship. <laughs> we're to be collaborative. We're to be able to prov provide collaborative project team environments. That makes sense. We're to effectively engage our stakeholders. Aha, some emphasis there. Focus on value. If we're not doing that as PMs, well, I don't know what we're doing. Recognize, evaluate, and respond to system interactions. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'd like to recognize the evaluate and respond to it <laughs> yeah. there's, le there's leadership behaviors there's tailoring we've talked a little bit about that before there's building quality in and i always say yes let's build quality in rather than inspect it in afterwards through <laughs> ivnv um we're to navigate complexity now that's i think fairly new to us from pmi and then the, the other ones that we're used to optimize risk responses embrace adaptability and resilience and enable change to achieve desired outcomes. I think all of those from a from a 12 step program, that's probably a bad way of putting it, but from 12 um, principles, I think those are very all encompassing. You know what's neat too? Um, as I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, that this is not just guidance for a project manager. <laughs> this true. is guidance for everybody who participates in a project. Um, I like the idea of complexity being there for many reasons. And uh, maybe we can actually use some of these principles as uh, topics in our future shows. There's a lot here we can actually discuss. Um, there, there is a lot here. <laughs> yeah. Um, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we have stewardship. Um, now you said stewardship. What was the other one that was sort of like humanistic? Um, Actually, I, I, thought, I thought there were a couple. Now we've talked about two of them before in a slightly different context. One was to deal with teams, and one was to deal with st stakeholders. We talked about those in domains, and I think yeah, maybe yeah. later on, later on, we can kind of um, compare uh, those two areas as stakeholder. I'm sorry, as uh, principles and those two as, as domains. Yeah, but I also, you, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. I also thought focus on value was more humanistic than perhaps technical. And I also thought leadership behaviors was more humanistic. So there's a few there that are human related versus the technical process oriented that we're so used to. That was the one that jumped out at me. Stewardship and leadership. 
And I was really wondering why both those were mentioned as principles. Because with leadership, you know, you talk about servant leadership, and that's a part of it, being of service. What's, what's this with stewardship? Well, I, I, I guess I should have studied this a little bit if I knew you were going to ask me that question. But here's, here's how I look at it. When I was growing up on the farm, I always go back to my roots, right? I remember my grandfather speaking a lot about stewardship. And the way he would kind of um, put it into context was, uh, we are responsible in life. Now, he spoke from a farming experience, but I think this is for all of us in whatever uh, careers we have. But he would say, it is up to us to be stewards of our financial resources, it's up to us to be stewards of the assets that we have, meaning that we're to take care of them. So, for example, if we had a year of crops that wasn't as productive as a previous year, we didn't take vacation that year. Not because we didn't deserve vacation, we worked just as hard, but from a financial stewardship, caring process, we kept back some of those assets to put the, to put the seed in next year rather than blow it if, if you want to put it that way on a vacation so i from his perspective and and as i always took this stewardship means taking care financially of our assets our assets being also our human resources on the project our um i think uh, one of the assets that we need to have be steward stewarding are those assets that we, when we begin to develop our relationships with our stakeholders, we need to steward those relationships. So I think it, it comes down to all of that taking care. How's that? Um, you cheated. You read but, the PMBOK. <laughs> no, I listened to my grandpa. I, that's one thing I did too. Oh, you know what? Your grandfather, it was in a total alignment with the ancient philosophers. Here's, here's how PMI defines it. And it's, it's probably one of the best definitions. Entrusted with the care. Huh, you said something about that. Yeah. Um, responsible management of resources. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> and also um, upholding values and ethics. So that's where the values and ethics get plugged in. It's the stewardship. It's having something in high regard or something that's worth sacrificing for. That's part of the mindset of stewardship. Well, and the other thing that grandpa would always say too, is if you borrow something, which we all have to do at some point, you take care of that better than if it were your own. And I, I remember that coming true because I, I had to borrow my neighbor's wheelbarrow one time to do some work around my house. And he graciously lent me his wheelbarrow. And um, a storm came up and I stupidly left it outside and it filled with rain. And I forgot about it for a couple of days and I came out and it had rusted. Now I've got this wheelbarrow. I've got my neighbor expecting me to return it back in the condition he lent it to me. And I've got my grandfather's words in the back of my mind, take care of others' assets as well as your own. So the only thing I could do was go to the uh, big box store and buy a brand new wheelbarrow and take it over to my neighbor. You that know, way. yeah, that, this, see, this is, this is where things get really interesting. And I read from Epictetus and Seneca, and I read from Aurelius and Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, and they take it to an insane degree. Like, what if you buy a car? If you're a thoughtful steward, that's not your car. You have paid for the honor of maintaining and using it on a regular basis so that when the next owner has it, they can get the same value out of it. So stewardship for the philosophers was like everything, even, even the human body you have, you're borrowing it for a certain amount of time, according to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I was just curious, when you're reading Aristotle, did he drive a Tesla or was it just a Chevy? <laughs> he, he, I, I, I could, I could wax poetic about this. <laughs> and um, it's funny, Seneca had his own principles 
um, where Epictetus had his own and Aristotle had his own. And it's, it's interesting that they looked at these as principles and their own values and their own ethics shaped the way they expressed those principles. The, the car analogy, you're right. I think, um, I think it, to me, he did take it further than even I would take it. And I'll tell you why, because I'm kind of a selfish creature as well. So when I buy a car, and I bought several over my lifetime, I maintain that car as well as I can because it needs to work for me flawlessly. I don't want to be stranded somewhere. The fact that I can then sell that car for used, uh, for top dollar used car sales, I, I, here's the selfish part. I didn't do that for the next person who's buying a good car for me. I did it for me to get the most value. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and again, it's only it's only proper, it's only right, because using up the value diminishes its functionality. Right. And and bottom line, it's <laughs> it's only common sense to be a steward of that which is given to you. Um, and it goes into our relationships, not just the things we buy. You know, we are stewards. We only have these relationships for a set amount of time. Yeah. And we are responsible for the relationships we have. So when I go back to that principle, it happens to be the first one they name, but they're very, Pimbach is very careful to say there's no hierarchical or not one is more important than another. But the first one that named says diligent, respectful, caring steward you and i have talked in the past about servant leadership you think there's a crossover there boy let's let's talk about that okay let's 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 differentiate leadership and then we'll talk about servant leadership and let me get my notes because this is a lot to keep in my head at one time <laughs> let's see here there we go um so leadership, let's, let's start off with leadership. We'll go easy. Um, leadership is where we're able to influence or guide individuals, teams, and organizations. Okay. That's what leadership is. We influence, yeah. we don't do the work. We create the environment for people to do the work. And when you get into servant leadership, um, this is where it says an understanding and practice of leadership. So it's one style that places the good of those led over the self-interest of the leader. It's sacrifice, yeah. okay? Emphasizing leader behaviors that focus on follower development, de-emphasizing glorification of the leader. Yeah, I actually went back, the, the person, and I forgot his name now, who coined the term in an essay that he wrote in the 1970s. It's, the term, it, was, it was Greenlee. I have that yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. well, the way he put it was, um, yes, there was the sacrificial aspect, but um, I think he also talked about the fact that it's a person who wants to be servant first, meaning he or she wants to put the needs or the priority needs of another person ahead of his or her own. And that made a lot of sense to me because if you have that tendency to be servant first, that will also evolve, I think, into the tendency of then wanting to lead because your influence is so much more effective over those that you are leading. So um, number one, I have the quote. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm good. staring at it right now. Great. The servant who by acting with integrity, one voice, both action and word, and spirit, builds trust and lifts people and help them grow. So that's our servant leadership. Yeah. And the leader who is trusted and who shapes others' destinies by going out ahead to show the way. You lead from the front. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And, and Simon Sinek actually talks about that. Um, Simon says servant leadership is the, uh, is the one who jumps into the battle first and, um, they don't jump in with a sword. They jump in with a shield. Well, and, and then, oh man, that makes so much sense. 
Um, I have found, and, and by the way, I did not come by this naturally. I came by this through some very um, ineffective leadership styles as a project manager. <laughs> And then I learned from my mistakes that it's better to be a servant leader than one who demands um, that his team um, perform in a certain way. But the whole idea of, of the certain servant leadership, quite often, um, I would jump in, roll up my sleeves, do something, offer it up and say, OK, let's let's improve upon this so that us as, so that we as a team can continue on forward. But that jumping in to get started, people would look and say, oh, he's not sitting in a ivory tower somewhere with emails telling us what to do. He's actually in there with us. And I think that part really worked well with my team. Yes, yes. It was somebody who is basically in alignment with the work and understands the work. And when you are behind a closed door, whether you're doing work or reading a magazine. First of all, people, <laughs> you're in the office, they don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Second of all, um, they assume that you're disconnected from uh, what's going on. And so it, the perceptions um, themselves block the work. So this topic of stewardship, I'm not sure that is directly synonymous with servant leadership, but I think it's an output from a servant leader's character. Yes, yes, yes. Um, that's exactly right. We have the leadership and we have the stewardship. We have that sense of value that's almost more valuable than what I can do or what I can contribute. And my value can grow if I adopt the mindset of a servant leader. That's, that's, I think, where this is leading us. I think so, too. And you had also used the word sacrifice a little earlier. Do you think sacrifice is part of that demeanor of a servant leader? <laughs> it's ethics. It's ethics. ethics. Um, the, it's the definition of ethics itself. Value is something I hold in high esteem, but it's also defined as something I'm willing to sacrifice for. I'm willing to forego one thing in order to get this. That is how I measure and quantify value. It's opportunity cost. Opportunity cost demonstrates sacrifice. Yeah, I, I have uh, I have an example that just as you were talking, it just came to my mind. I have a friend in California who owns um, several boutique hotels. And when the pandemic hit, um, he naturally lost a lot of business. He His hotel, I'll call them chain, even though they're all unique hotels, they lost a lot of business. And he, um, yes, he's a very wealthy man, but still he put himself on a dollar a year salary so that he could salvage jobs for people who were in his organization that he did not want to lose just because he was not having a lot of business come his way. And I thought that was, maybe you look at him while well, he's already wealthy, so maybe that's not a sacrifice, but in many ways it shows that sacrificial, sacrificial attitude that he would be willing to put himself last so that those people who are working for him and with him uh, can maintain their jobs. And this is not, this is not, um, an emotional decision. This is a pragmatic decision that we can use data to demonstrate. Um, let me give you another example. How much quality should I put into a project? Should every project be like Six Sigma or ISO 10,000 quality? Well, I, there's an easy answer to that, I think. We just, uh, I just came through on a project that I'm doing where the first aspect of this project in the competitive arena was a uh, proof of technology or a proof of concept. Naturally, if you want two or three competing organizations to develop that proof of concept, you don't want them to do it to the nth degree that we would expect of a full-fledged project. So in that situation, and maybe that's an over-simplistic example, but in that situation, I would not ex expect full quality. Mm -hmm. So, so the what we do is we look at something called optimal quality, which go. is a balance. And the definition of optimal quality is where the benefits of the quality activities 
equal the cost. It's the break even of the quality. Now, that's how you determine how much quality to put into a project, how much servant leadership, how much sacrifice. I think if we actually put it through that same rigor, we can come up with something pretty quantifiable. The benefits of servant leadership still equal the cost. If you're, if you're sacrificing more than what you're getting out of it, if it's not contributing to project success, if you look at your data, if you look at the health and the organization of the team, if you look at the engagement and the contribution of the individuals and the demonstration of your servant leadership is not contributing, that's when you start pulling back. Yeah, and, and as you were speaking there, I, I was thinking now, I, show, I talked about the proof of concept as one extreme kind of, of something where you wouldn't expect driving quality in from day one. On the other hand, several years ago, we put the first man on the moon. Do you think that team was absolutely wedded to making sure they had the best quality um, process to put those people on that moon? I'm thinking. And, I, yeah. and I'm, thinking, I'm thinking there was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of late nights, a lot of lost weekends and family dinners and that to make sure that those men traveled safely there and back. Well, and, and think about the whole Apollo 13 incident, you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's one of my favorite agile activities that I can use as an example. Um, they're not worried about passing inspection. They're going through the trash and finding out whatever they can use to keep alive. Yeah. Um, and, and again, this is, this is what we do. Um, this is the way the human mind works. You know, this, this whole idea of optimal um right now it seems that my students are really resonating and they're benefiting from this mindset of servant leadership and i can i can see a time in the future where servant leadership is it's not going out of style but there are other things that the future project managers can benefit from that are not necessarily so prescient. Look at the world around us, you know? It's confusing, it's full of doubt. There's too much ambiguity um, and there's so much change. And yeah. so with servant leadership right now, it makes sense in investing in a lot of it. Well, there is, <laughs> and think about this. Um, let's say I'm the leader of my family, which my family believes that I am. <laughs> I'm not sure always, but okay, I'm the leader of my family. My grandson is over to, to visit with me, and suddenly he decides he's going to dash out into the street. Now, as a servant leader, would I say, young man, would you please come back here? I don't think that's a very good idea. Or would I yell at him and go grab him and yank him back? Right. <laughs> there's times to be leader, and there's times to be servant leader, and there's times... And I think that what you were just getting to with that last um, with that last comment was the fact that we need to be able to also tailor our leadership style based on what's happening. Yeah. And, and with the uncertainty in the world, and even, I mean, quite frankly, our industry has adapted so well through the pandemic with going online and with Zoom and all these sorts of things. We know we can adapt, but I'm sure that in certain situations there, in order to get the entire group to adapt, including your client stakeholders in that, to adapt to this new world. I'm sure that some of the niceties of a servant leader were kind of put to the side while we made these things happen. Well, and, and again, it may be exactly within the scope of a servant leadership, uh, servant leader. For instance, we were going through a really major reorg somewhere around 2003 to 2004. And there was a lot of doubt in the group. And so they had a series of management uh, discussions. They were all face to face and they were saying, here's what's going on. Here's what we don't know. Here's what we do know. And we'll give you the information as soon as we can. And we expect 
to actually be supporting you in your decisions, but at the same time, we expect to keep the business running. How are we going to do this together as a group? Yeah. And it uh, that was actually servant leadership too, because a leader may be trying to influence in a direction where a servant leader says, maybe I don't have the best ideas. Maybe I need to bring the group together and maybe I'll facilitate. And that's facilitation is a big part of this, this whole servant leadership mindset where you step out of the decision making and let the smart people do that while you guide the process. That's true. And here's the other part. And for people who are listening to us today who are not necessarily in leadership roles yet, you don't have to wait until you're a manager to be a servant leader. I mean, if you see your team members struggling with uh, some sort of customization or, or um, some sort of coding problem on your team, what if you stayed late with that person and helped them out? That, you know, that's a sacrifice on your part. You might miss a meal to help that person out, but that's being a servant leader, kind of putting forward that sacrificial part of you to make sure that the other person succeeds. Well, and, and it doesn't have to be that dramatic either. Leadership can be setting aside my opinion, sacrificing my point of view um, on the chance that somebody else has more information, not speaking first. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Absolutely. I, uh, <clears throat> there's several years ago, I had a young man who, my goodness, he showed some great signs of, of wanting to lead. But one of the things he really, I could tell there was something unique about him in terms of his ability to be eloquent in his speech, but he wanted to be able to move people, to influence people. And there were several times that I stayed back with him on a Saturday and worked with him in an auditorium to develop his oratory style, to develop his speech style, such that he then went, within a couple of years, he went on the speaking circuit and that became his primary mode of, of, of making a living. Wow. But... Had I not, and I'm, and I'm not sitting here beating my chest, I'm just saying that this is some of the things we can watch out for. Had I not noticed that, first of all, and then sacrificed, I'll put that in quotes, my time to spend with him, he might not have ever achieved that. And so I think, you know, from now, we're still good friends. We haven't worked together over, in over 10 years, but nonetheless, we still connect and, and I'm still looking at how well he's advancing. And I'm so pleased with his advancement. So, so let's dissect this. Mm. This is not just servant leadership or leadership. This is true stewardship. And it's, you know, you have servant leadership, which is that sacrifice, but you have stewardship, which is entrusted with the care. Yeah. And it's the responsible management of these resources. That's, that's really what's, what's interesting. And as we're talking, I'm starting to discover that stewardship is really not leadership per se, but it's a respect and it's a recognition of value around us such that we make sure that that value is not diminished through our action or inaction. It's almost like I get this picture of stewardship of kind of putting a hedge of protection around what it is that you're responsible for. And so if you value it and respect that you're going to protect it. So that, that's being steward. That's there's probably no good verb, is there? That's being a good steward of that particular asset or those assets. Right, right. Now, what's neat is that they work really well in tandem. This, this actually gives me an idea of why they distinctly stated stewardship and leadership, and they both put them as principles. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that I'm really interested in <coughs> is <coughs> this whole idea of having these um, um, these things like um, team and stakeholders 
and um, having them as domains, but also thinking of them as principles as well. So I thought of that. And when we, when we talked about domains last time, we talked about, for example, um, having high performing teams. So the team domain, for example, would be, um, the result would be a high performing team, one in which interpersonal skills amongst the team members were demonstrated. So if that's the domain that we're trying to achieve, the principle that we're putting in place is to create that environment that will result in that, in that domain. You've naturally come to it. Um, this is what I teased out. You're exactly right. Think about it this way. The domains are our tar target. Okay, that's that's what we're focusing on, and and that's what that's what PMI says. The domains provide you the focus of your attention, and the principles guide the behavior, and so the behavior is the action that's directed towards the focus. So we have this stewardship and leadership that can be applied across all of these domains. And so similar for the stakeholder, what I want from a stakeholder is I want that productive relationship. And, but my end result is I want a satisfied stakeholders because after all, that's who hired me, right? So the principle, that would be the domain. So the principle to achieve that then would be to proactively engage with stakeholders as opposed to keeping them as an afterthought like we used to do in the good old days. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. That's the behavior that we provide the focus within. So what we're doing here is we're actually starting to figure out not just how principles and domains work, but why we would might have them as domains over here and why we might have principles over here. Well, you and I have discussed how many thousands of times already, I think, I'm exaggerating, <laughs> that projects are not projects unless you have team and unless you have stakeholder there is no such thing as a project without team or stakeholder and it's the project team that delivers value to the stakeholder therefore why not create a specific domain around those areas so that you focus on developing and delivering what it is that you intend to and and actually the pembok and the exam content outline that pmi um, released earlier, and all of the training material from PMI says this is somewhat more important. You have to get this right first, yeah. and then you can talk about getting a good schedule and budget and risk and quality and everything else. That's not to take away from the fact that you need to have those foundational um, processes in your kind of in your hip pocket anyway. I mean, you know, I can have the most affable servant leader, wonderful person who doesn't know what a Gantt chart is, right? So there still is that that uh, dichotomy that you have to be able to uh, to deal with. But. Exactly. You want to you want to actually think about these lofty strategies and objectives and visions, but you still have to brush your teeth. <laughs> you yeah. still have to balance your checkbook. You still have to stay on a regular schedule. These things don't go away, but the thing is working with them together is what we figure out. But you know what? If you look at the life cycle of anybody through the management spectrum, they, they go through that anyway, just like project managers do. You know, We learn the scheduling, we learn how to work with people, we learn how to get more out of people, and then we grow as middle managers and we learn how to actually step away from directing the work but building the people who build the teams and then we go beyond that and so as we are maturing in our understanding of what management is we're also looking at it from a pmi standpoint a pmi saying hey maybe it's time for project managers to step up and take more of an executive role and become leaders and become, and leaders. become leaders yeah. yeah you know we've been talking this whole time we've been kind of interrelate well we have been interrelating stewardship and servant leadership 
we've been showing how the, the principles of team and, and, uh, and shareholder or stakeholder also pertain in this. There seems to be a lot of the personal and the interpersonal that gets woven in all of this discussion. That's tough. <laughs> I know where this is going. Yeah. Um, oh, that's tough. I, you know, and that's the thing. Uh, a lot of my students ask, does the team come first or do the individuals? It's, it's an, yet another one of those chicken and eggs. What do you think about that? I, I, the answer is yes. <laughs> well, think about it this way. There's, you've got project teams that are highly relational. And that could be good or bad. You can have bad relationships as well as good relationships. But the whole idea is you're striving for good relations. You've also got <clears throat> collaborative efforts or not. And if you have the not, you try to make them come around. You try to bring them around to the collaborative yes. You've got some interdisciplinary issues. So you've got uh, people who are dealing with training and people who are dealing with technical, but they're not silos. They still have to work together. So I think. When it comes to satisfying the results or the value for your stakeholder, you need to begin with team and that interdisciplinary, that collaborative, that all of that. But you can't have a collaborative team unless each individual wants to be collaborative and is, has a mindset towards that. You can't have a good relating team with, within or with your stakeholder unless each person has that mindset to want to have a good relationship. So I think it's both. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, there's a couple things that each team member needs to contribute, right? They need to contribute to the work and they need to contribute to the engagement. They need to be plugged into the project, but they need to also be plugged into the team. They, they are part of the work. And if they are a team member, they, they have to do their part or the project's going to fail, right? Second of all, they have to be plugged into the network of the team, which means the communications, the sharing of the information, the, the activities, they have to behave and interact as another team member. Or, number one, they're going to be isolated or snubbed by the rest of the team, or they themselves are going to feel isolated, which is going to be a downward spiral. So you have to take care of the individuals, but it's the team that creates the work. It's not the individuals. That's exactly right. And, and here's where servant leadership can come in from a, from a team management or leadership aspect for you as a project manager or as a team leader. The beautiful part of this is knowing that you need to have those individuals have that mindset that means if you spend time helping them achieve their goals, that is rewards, recognition, promotion, uh, job satisfaction, all of those sorts of things, they will naturally want to come together, do the job that they're intended so that they can, so the, although those sorts of things can result in their experience, you know, they can experience those and therefore they become part of that team. But it can start with you as servant leader. Yeah, and, and this is something that anybody can do. It's, <clears throat> it's connecting the fulfillment of the personal needs of the individual yeah. and connecting those to the work that they're doing. And like you said, it's, 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 a Maslow, uh, it's a Maslow exercise, right? What are the needs of that individual? What do they need? Do they just need a paycheck or do they need a sense of purpose? Do they need to be respected or do they just need to be part of the group and understanding that and then helping them connect fulfillment of those needs to the work and they'll do better that with with that effort they'll do better than you could ever ask them for if the people are selfish okay we are we are and and actually this exercise will get you better results um, this is not me speaking, and this is not Maslow speaking. This is experience speaking. Yeah, I've actually had the, the pleasure of watching an individual who's in it for the paycheck. And typically, individuals who are in it just for the paycheck don't go very far. <clears throat> You'll see them job hunting, job skipping, that sort of thing. But I've had the pleasure of working with individuals, individuals like that. And infusing a little bit of, uh, wow, that was great when they did something 
terrific and were recognized for it, suddenly the paycheck was just as important as it was before, but now they really wanted to contribute because they loved that attention, you know, in certain cases, or they loved the promotion or something along those lines. So there's ways as a servant leader, as a true leader, to work with your individuals to help them meet their own personal, as you said, selfish goals to get ahead and to contribute um, most highly. And we can do this also at the team level. It's it. This is what's really neat. Um, you know, it's it's not we are family with a team. We yeah. are a well honed. We are a well invested. We are a very supportive sports team. You know, we all know our skills and we know how the skills work together as a group. And there is no better sense of, um, of satisfaction working as a team. We actually get a neurological <laughs> boost yeah. when, when, we, when we have this sense. Um, and I've had that maybe three times in my life when I was part of a group where it was, quote unquote, the group. And we felt like we were really something unique. And it's, and it's, it is a good feeling. I, you know, it just reminded me too, that um, you don't have to be the actual named leader of the group to be the servant leader for the group. Um, several years ago, I was involved in a uh, situation, involved, I was hired to in advisory services as part of a project management organization advising the client organization, which happened to be a government department within a large state. What's interesting was it was in my contract that I was not allowed to direct state work. That is the workers that were on the team that I was assigned to. Mm -hmm. I could not tell them what to do. However, through this, this mindset that you and I are just talking to and appealing to their selfishness, I'll call it selfishness, but appealing to their higher order of what they wanted to get done, I could influence them such that no matter what happened, we soon became a very strong collaborative team and worked forward and moved forward as a single organization to produce the results on time and within budget. So much so that they would come to me as their advisor before they would go to their own direct manager for advice. So it was, wow. there are things you can do even if you are not named the manager or the leader or the, or whatever. Yeah. And, and the problem is, the problem is it's not actionable steps that you're doing. It's creating that emotional and intellectual uh, uh, environment. That's the only word I have. It's, it's creating that culture um, that, that shared uh, mindset that says, you know, this is something we value. Yeah. Absolutely. This is, oh man, I'm, I'm enjoying this discussion. I don't, you know, we're closing in a little bit on the hour, but my goodness, we've, I think we've uncovered a lot of interesting, interesting things. So um, if I were, if I were listening to this podcast as an inspiring leader, or, or even as a um, experienced leader, how would you, Tim, advise me to work on this exploring the stewardship and this servant leadership aspect for myself in my career how might i go about doing that <laughs> so um write down i am a human being just like the people i'm leading and then you put together a bunch of exercises and a bunch of experiments in your daily work, whether it's office or whether it's chores around your family or whatever, and say, I'm going to practice this on myself. <laughs> I'm going to lead myself and I'm going to see how the results are and do a lot of self-talking, but take it, take it semi-seriously and document it and observe the results. Um, this is how everybody learns to lead. They learn to lead by applying the discipline of leadership on themselves. And this is what happens. None of us is born to lead. Right. None of us. We all learn. And this is how you do it by saying that didn't work. <laughs> now, you can do it like I did 
which was making mis mistakes in projects, or you can do it within your own experiments and where the mistakes might not be so influential. But the magic is, this is the magic. By learning how to lead yourself, number one, you gain self-discipline, self-awareness, and also a little bit of emotional intelligence, which is that control. Number yeah. two, people will notice the difference. Yeah. People, I, yeah, I, I definitely can relate to that. I know there's, there was times when I had a J-O-B that is in an office. People would say, he's always in at 7 a.m. I, it just so happens I'm a morning person. I like to be there. I could get an hour's work of work done before people came in. But people knew that I was there. And so that discipline that I applied to myself, it sort of it, it fought, resonated with them. Some of them would say, oh, I can't, I can't get in before nine. Well, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's perfectly okay. But the fact that they could count on me predictably with that discipline approach, absolutely was uh, reflective on how they were then related to me in other areas. Yeah. And, and repeated experience of observing you in early, that's what we call trust. <laughs> you, you're, you're basically engendering trust by doing it over and over and over again. And that's, that's why this, this thought exercise of doing experiments and learning how to do it to yourself is important um, that this is and and again our folklore our myths our mm -hmm. our fairy tales are all about people who start off in confusion and they go off and they study themselves for a little bit and they come back changed and this is the path that we take in learning how to be a leader we all we all take it one way or the other well the the other way to take it is through um finding and requesting and, and, and asking for a mentor. Um, you know, sometimes no matter how deeply you look, you can't see those flaws or those things that are holding you back. Well, but yeah, you get a yeah. mentor who's gone before you and who is also that you've given permission to say, um, I think you should do this a little differently. I, that, that will help you grow leaps and bounds also in the whole stewardship and servant leadership aspect of Well, leadership. yeah, and, and um, to add to that, it's having somebody who's able to demonstrate these things. See, what we're talking about are things that are not necessarily you can you can just pick up from a book. Right. Um, but seeing somebody and seeing some of these things in action actually generate those light bulbs where just, you know, studying the theory doesn't do it. Well, and that, and here's the other thing is, you know, I. I told you, I think about my, my experience working for the state of Hawaii when I had a mentor come in and work with me for about eight, eight or 10 months. And, and I realized that he was here to help me and therefore I would watch. So he would be asked a difficult question in a meeting and I would watch how he responded. He would sometimes pause for five seconds before he would respond. And I go, why is he doing that? And so then I would try that in a particularly difficult situation. And it worked. <laughs> so you have to you have to be observing, and then you have to be willing to take that in upon yourself. Um, so yeah, mentors are so absolutely incredible. But if the onus is still on you to work with that mentor, to take the advice, and to watch. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 not something that you're given. It's something that the the leadership is not something you're given. It's something that you earn. Exactly. You, you mentioned books, and I know we'll wrap this up here shortly, but um, I think people can take information from books and then watch for those characteristics, perhaps on the job from someone they respect. A couple of books that I know helped me a lot were um, Goldman's book on working with emotional intelligence. You know, that helped me to understand how other people were reacting to me in certain situations, and then I could watch other people do it. Another one was Drucker's book on the effective executive. So yes, that was also, yes, yes. So a couple, I think from those, you can take ideas, but you're so right. You still have to see them in action and practice them for yourself. Yeah, it, it makes it more real. I'm, I'm a real um, uh, managing oneself is another great Drucker book on how to learn how to learn and how to learn to uh, 
acquire the the uh, capability of leadership. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> well, I see our hour is up. This has been a great discussion again. We seem to be having wonderful discussions and we just like to let other people in on them. That's, I think that's- Yeah, and, and, and yeah, all of you who are watching, we do this on a regular basis. If you uh, leave in the comments that you'd like to participate in these live sessions, tell us and we'll uh, start promoting the link. Um, we're gonna continue this. We have, we have probably a year and a half more shows just <laughs> scheduled. We're just waiting to talk. and We can't wait to talk about them with you. So they can find me on LinkedIn this week as well. And, and I assume they can find you there as well. Yep. I'm, I'm out at LinkedIn. I'm, I'm committed to at least responding to emails and, yep. and messages twice a week there. Yeah. No, I think this has been great. And then I guess until we, uh, until we meet again a week from today, we'll, uh, we'll pass the baton to the people who close us out. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day and we'll talk to you soon. You bet. We'll see you.